Hello, Dental Online Trainers, Dr. Dennis Hartley, back with you again for another ShareCast episode. Well, actually, we're giving our team at DOT a little summer break, so we're revisiting one of our favorite episodes. That's our interview with Grace Young, founder of Mommy Dentist and Business. Now, Grace is a pediatric dentist that happened to be on a business trip with her husband, who he happens to be an attorney. Now, Grace noticed how the attorneys were connecting and networking. And she recognized that there was a need for this in the dental place also. She recognized that, you know what, there's these Facebook groups that were already existing. But what she realized that there were people like her, moms who are also business owners, owners of their dental practices. And she felt like there was not a great opportunity for to be able to get questions answered in these forums that were already available. So Grace founded Mommy Dentist and Business, MDIB, as a gateway for other mom dentists to connect, to share their struggles, to get advice on everything from managing childcare to managing their dental team, and, you know, perhaps even make some new friends along the way. So listen, kick back and relax and enjoy our encore episode with Dr. Grace Young. Hello, Dental Online Trainers, Dr. Dennis Hartley with you again with another ShareCast that I think you're just going to love. Today, I get to speak with Dr. Grace Yum, who coincidentally practices as a pediatric dentist not far from my practice in Glenview, Illinois. Dr. Yum started a little side hustle she calls Mommy Dentists in Business several years ago when she recognized a need for a safe place for women dentists that were also moms to meet and talk about the challenges and difficulties of juggling being a mom, a spouse, a dentist, and very often a business owner. Now, obviously, as a male, there are many issues that women dentists, let alone mothers who are dentists, have to manage that quite simply, I've not had to deal with in my lifetime. I think most of us would admit, for better or for worse, it's often the female or the mother of the family that has to manage their schedules if the other spouse is also working. If a child gets sick or, you know, say, God forbid, as we learned during COVID, if the school closes and the parents become the homeschool teacher's aide. Again, these are challenges for all parents, not just moms, all parents, but in many relationships, the brunt of the care falls on the moms. So listen in on part one when we learn about Dr. Yum's journey to discover her passion for pediatric dentistry. Dr. Yum shares about her early career interests when she was in journalism and communications, and she talks about the winding pathway. She was influenced by her friend, as we've heard so often in our conversations on this year cast, that eventually led her into dentistry and then eventually pediatric dentistry. Grace also talks about the power of mentorship, which is part of her influence in going into dentistry and how to establish yourself as a young dentist. She shares about how she manages parents and family members when supporting pediatric dentists. So kick back and relax and enjoy my conversation with Dr. Grace Yum. Hello, Dental Online Trainers, Dr. Dennis Hartley, back with you again with another splendid interview today that I know you're just going to love, and I am super excited to spend some time getting to know better a person I met several years ago, pre-COVID. This is Dr. Grace Yum, who was practicing dentistry in my community in Glenview, Illinois. So let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Grace, and uh, Grace, you can sort of correct me where I, where I err. Uh, she grew up in the sort of the North Shore suburbs in, of, in Glenview, right? You grew up yes. in Glenview. Which, which high school did you go to? GBS. That sounds for Glenbrook South Titans right. all the way. See, that's how they are there. They're either GBN or GBS, and I just wanted to get your reaction. That's usually how they respond, so that's awesome. Um, she went to Northwestern for undergrad, right? Yes. Yep. And she got a degree in speech. Is that right? In like communication speech? Yes. Communications. School yeah. speech. Yeah. And you know, Northwestern's like killer for that. I mean, that's journalism and yes. speech. I mean, uh, that yeah. was, that was my direction. That was my hope to be a journalist. Ah, uh, and here you are maybe, maybe circling back around. So uh, after Northwestern, then you went down to University of Maryland. You're a Terrapin dentist. So yes. you did uh, the home of the, the, the Maryland Bridge. The Maryland Bridge and the first dental museum in the world and also the first dental school in the world. Ah, there we go. All right. I went to Michigan and we, we had a pretty cool museum, but I don't know that it was, uh, you know, there's only so much stuff you can fancy over old <laughs> dentistry. So uh, then after your uh, dental school experience, you went back up to Chicago and you did your pediatric uh, training at Children's Memorial. Well, what did they call it back then? Was it Ch- Children's Memorial 
Um, yes, it was Children's Memorial Hospital, which part of Northwestern, now, part of Northwestern under the Northwestern umbrella, and it is now called Lurie's and uh, Robert, okay. you know, Lurie Children's Hospital. They since have taken it over, and the campus is now fully downtown. Before it was located in Lincoln Park. Chicago. Right. Yeah. Now they got their fancy new building and stuff. Yes, it's it's beautiful. Yeah, so I have a, a consultant I used to work with, uh, Mark Cooper. He used to say that dogs were angels with fur. And I have always said that pediatric dentists are angels with a dental drill. And a rubber dam. <laughs> because, and I say this, I say this for, 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 our, for our viewers, listeners. Um, I used to practice with a pediatric dentist, someone that Grace knows, one of someone who trained her, Dr. Nancy Ajawi. And yes. I... I tell you, I, there, there, there's a few, there's a few memories I have um, of pain in, in my, in my life. And these are like things that you like, just come back to you, right? I think about it and I can feel the pain immediately. Oh, One boy. was, um, I was skiing out in uh, Beaver Creek and I, uh, and I hit a, hit an edge and I did the Superman and I broke my humerus. And I remember that immediately. Um, I was playing tennis with a buddy on these old tennis courts and uh, the tennis ball hit a crack and, and deviated in a direction that dropped me to my knees. And that aye, I remember. Aye. And the third is I remember being bit by a kid um, when I was doing my residency at Mount Sinai Hospital. And I tell you, I still feel this to today. I haven't gotten over that feeling. And uh, so God bless you and oh, all pediatric well, dentists out there. You, you are. Angry. I think that's that's a rite of passage to have been bitten once. <laughs> yeah, I took that passage out. <laughs> yeah, right, 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 right. I don't need that anymore. That's enough. Once is enough for me. Oh, uh, all right. So uh, I, I want to talk about how you got into all that stuff, but just sort of to finish up on your background, after you finished up with your pediatric rotation, you did some, uh, you started a couple of practices in the Chicago area, one in Glenview and yeah. then one in, um, it wasn't Lincoln Park. What was your other practice? Logan Square? It, it was Lakeview, Lakeview area near Wrigleyville. Okay, gotcha. Yes. And you have since uh, sold off those practices, but uh, about four or five years ago, you started what's called Mommy's Dentist in Business, um, which, is, which is really, really cool, really fascinating. And I want to talk about how you got into that, but I want to talk a little bit more about your background, how you got into dentistry. A lot of things that I like to learn about is sort of how people got into dentistry. And the stories are always so fascinating, Grace. I sure. tell you, I mean, it is really interesting. Talk to, I was talking to Jeff Rouse a bit back on our, our Surecast and how he ended up in dentistry was just complete happenstance. Um, and everyone I talked to, they have a very unique paths, I think, getting in. Um, so anything that I didn't uh, that I didn't talk about in your sort of dental pathway that you wanted to to add? It's sort of like a eulogy. Only the thing is, you get to stand up and correct <laughs> people, right? Like in a eulogy, you're not going to stand up and correct people. Here, you can say, "Well, right. that you're close, but you missed on that." Anything that Aww. I missed? Well, my journey is interesting and unique in that it was more family related, and my family dentist who he has since retired, Dr. Sam Yoon, he was best friends with my dad and he encouraged me to go into dentistry mm. while I was at Northwestern. His kids are also in dentistry. One's an orthodontist and the other is a periodontist. You may know one of his children, do, Dr. Yeah, Cecile Yoon yeah, yeah, Tarly. For sure. mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. So da Cecile was my very, very first mentor. Uh -huh. And my dad said, you know, Cecile is now practicing as an associate in other practices. She needs an assistant. You are now her assistant. Oh, so interesting. I went everywhere Cecile went, basically. So she worked in different offices. And even though I was in undergrad, right. you know, I had to go help her because she's like my older sister. Uh -huh. So that's how I was introduced to really hands-on. I mean, my only exposure then was just to see her dad for cleanings and fillings. Sure. And when I went with her, I knew nothing. She had to right. train me from scratch and she was a young new dentist as well. So she didn't know anything. Right. So <laughs> everywhere I went, you know, the assistants, they are trained me then. Sure. Yeah. And it developed into something more while I was an undergrad at Northwestern, she ended up working for, and the world is so small, 
Dr. Fippinger and Dr. Simone. Sure, of course. Yeah. And Dr. Dr. Simone was just in my chair two days ago. Oh, really? So Dr. <laughs> so I also worked for Dr. Simone. So Cecile oh. brought me into that practice as her orthodontic assistant. Oh, but then because I was on campus, it's in Evanston. So I was sure. right there, you know, right. Church Street is right there. I could walk. And they were short staffed. And of course they had their main assistants, but they sure. wanted me to help in the pedo wing because they had it like pedo and ortho separate wings. Mm -hmm. And I gladly, you know, worked over there. But if for those who you listeners who are not in the dentistry world, you know that ortho is completely different. A set of, you know, set of instruments. Yeah, absolutely. And, and they're everything. not even you know, Grace, they're not even dentists. Let's be honest. <laughs> we joke that. about it, right? I'm like, do you even know how to give anesthetic? <laughs> so, and, and, and they're like, no, and we're glad we don't have to do that. Right, right, right. I'm like, you don't even extract teeth. So just joking like, to all your orthodontists out there. Right, right, right. I, we I, love I, you. I love we you love you. We love, love you. you but it's, just it's so anyhow, I was introduced to pediatric dentistry through that journey. And they were saying, you are good with your hands. You should consider dental school. And I said, I am not good at science. I am here. Like my major is communications. I want to be on the news. I want to yeah. be a news anchor. So, so take me back. So you're, you're an undergrad. You had no interest in going to dentistry. You're looking at going into communications. And right. you know, so what year were you when you started assisting Dr. Dr. Now you and Tarly? I think I was a sophomore. All right, so you're taking you're taking a whole different curriculum than that would set you on pace for dentistry, right? Completely, you're completely different. But Cecile and some of the other doctors who I worked with, and at the time, I also who was an associate there was Dr. Ray Girado, well, sure. who is the clinical director of the program at Lurie's, mm -hmm. and I worked for him as a chair site assistant on Saturdays, and that's how I got to know him, and he trained me, but he wasn't the director at the time. This okay. was, mm -hmm. you know, he was not at Lurie's. And so Cecile kept saying, just take the basic prereqs for dental school because you never know. You just don't know. And she's That's like, and advice. I would hate, you know, she's like, you're in school. Just take some of the courses. I would hate for you to change your mind and want to go to dental school, but then you've already graduated. Right. And now you have to do all that again. It's so you know, my being, you know, her being her younger sister, I, I listened to what she told me and I took good some for of the you. I never listened to my older brothers. So and that's very good of you. I, I mean, I, I took what she said. I looked up to her, you know, and, and so sure. I was like, okay, well, it doesn't hurt, but I really quickly realized that science for me, I enjoyed it, but it wasn't my forte. It, it wasn't something that I just automatically got A's in, you know, sure. I, mm -hmm. I really had to study to even get a, like a B. So I took the DIT and my parents encouraged and supported me. And they were just like, you know, just do the best you can. And if it doesn't work, you know, if, if you, it's a backup, like if journalism doesn't Dentistry work Dentistry is your backup plan. Dentistry is your backup plan. And I was like, oh, that's a weird way to think about it, but okay. So you know, that was my backup plan to go to dental school. And so I wasn't that student that was cutthroat or trying to get an A in everything or trying to get the high score on the DIT. So I just did the best that I could really. And I took a gap year. So after I graduated, I worked in consulting for a consultant in Evanston. And then I was, I was missing dentistry because I stopped assisting. I stopped doing all of that. And I said, you know, I really miss it. I miss being chair side. And I'm, I miss all the different things that I did because they had me, I worked for uh, Dr. Barry Walvert at one time. Sure, I know Barry for sure. Yeah, I, I worked uh, for Dr. Jan Rizdalski. No, Jan, I, Dr. talk about Jan. So, I mean, I learned so much and I, I thought, gosh, I really miss it. And they all thought I was very good with children, especially the children with special needs. Like when a uh -huh. child with special needs came in, they were looking for me. Well, let me back up for a second, Grace, before you get into that, because I think that's really interesting. And for all those who aren't in the Chicago community, sorry for all these dentist names that are worth throwing out, but uh, they're all uh, people that I work with as well. So I'm curious about when you first sat down as a, as a dental assistant, the first day that you're with Dr. Yoon, and so your sophomore year of Northwestern, and now you're, I mean, it's, it's not a normal situation for somebody to be sitting knee to knee with another person and then delivering 
you know, medical care or dental care to somebody. So what was, do you remember what your first thoughts were when you, when you sat down in like sure. in a clinical situation? Were you like, oh, this, this is like crazy or this is awesome or where? So no, where I was, I was like, this is so cool. Yeah. And only because growing up, I was the kid that helped my dad around the house, you know, build furniture, fix things. And even now I like to like tinker with stuff. Like I like stuff toys. Like I like tinkering with things. Mm -hmm. And so ortho was perfect because it was very mechanical and I was really mm -hmm. good at like putting things together. And so quickly they were training me quickly. And I remember Dr. Rizdalski trained me how to put, place turbos. He's like, wow, you're good at that. Like I learned really quickly, just sure. picked up the hand stuff. And as, as I learned ortho, the orthodontist mostly are the diagno you know they're doing the diagnosing and doing the treatment plans but the assistants really do a lot of the techni technical things right correct yes and so they taught me how to do all kinds of things and i became very adept at it and they were quickly pointing out you have very good hand skills to me i didn't know what that meant in dentistry sure of course right? yeah i mean when you're so, not in it you're right so they they were just kept encouraging me saying you've got very good hand skills you can do this you should think about dentistry. I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, when I, when I took that gap year and I wasn't doing dentistry, I really missed it. But what I really love most was the relationship with the patient and the parent and feeling good about the work I was doing and making a difference in someone's life. Yeah. And with orthodontics, you see that right away because of the teeth moving and the shifting and the confidence and the smiles and, yep. and how special it is to get your braces off. And, and so I felt very, I thought when I worked with the consultant, I was very, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? struggling with, do I continue this path in being a journalism? Am I helping people versus in the dental office, I was really helping someone and making a difference. Well, it's personally. tangible, right? I mean, it's tangible. You can see it. You know, when we do cosmetic dentistry, we can see the way they react. If so, if you're writing right. something, you know, and it, it's nice because as you've done your, your podcast and you've written your stuff, you know that you're getting feedback from people, right? They say, you know, Grace, I really enjoyed your interview. I enjoyed this, right? But it's a different experience, right? It's more tangible. It's more, I think, when, when it's person to person, it's, right. there's, there's some emotion that's different uh, as nice as it is, as it is getting, you know, emails or getting, you know, notes from people, there is right. that you, you get those hugs, right? You literally right. get physical hugs right. and you get these emotional hugs. Right. And you see, you get to see them often. Yep. So mm -hmm. with ortho, you get to see them often, but then when they're done, they're done. And then you don't see them as often. Yep. But mm -hmm. with, what I loved about uh, Simone's and Dr. Fibbinger's practice was with children, you see them yearly, you know, every year, like you get to watch them grow up, you get to be a part of their lives. Yep. And that to me was so fulfilling. I really loved that part of dentistry. Let me ask you a question. So for our, for those who are like looking, getting into dentistry and for those who are in dental school now, um, what advice, well, let, let me rephrase this. Would you advise that they go and spend time dental assisting and getting Absolutely. into a dental? Yeah. Absolutely. That is the best time spent. And I often tell people who are interested, you won't know truly what dentistry is unless you are in the office. And I fortunately had the opportunity to work in every single position. <laughs> Yeah. And you worked in several practices, which I think is really important. Also. But they put me at the front. They put me in the back. They mm -hmm. put me, I was taking out the trash, cleaning the toilets, sweeping the lab, you know, pouring up models. I did everything. And back then there weren't really computers. I had to take insurance forms, put it in the typewriter, okay. type it up, mail it out, pull paper charts. And I literally did everything, sterilization, you name it, I did it. Let me explain to our young viewers, um, a typewriter is a thing that's like a computer. <laughs> this is weird, but you're gonna actually put a piece of paper inside of it and it has ink and you hit the same sort of keyboard and you get a piece of paper out that would be like, you know, something like this that I have <laughs> typing on it. So that's what a typewriter is for, for our viewers. Google it. <laughs> Ask Alexa. <laughs> Ask Alexa. Go on YouTube, they'll show you how a typewriter, how the Corona, the Smith Corona worked. Right. Uh, but yeah, I mean, this is, I see, I, I, I was fortunate I got to teach at Marquette Dental School for about 25 years. And so I had a lot of um, connection with young dentists. 
And one of the things that I, I would really advise is get into dental offices, get into different dental offices, see how they're running, get the different aspects. Look, you know, you know, pull back the pull back the curtain a little bit. So, you know, get up in the front, get in the back, and do all the little things and understand how a dental practice runs because it is a yes. business, which is yes. what we're going to lead to in a little bit with your uh, DMID. Yes. So. Um, I said that wrong. It's MDID. I went DMID. So sorry about that. It's okay. <laughs> uh, in, in your consulting life, then you're looking back and you're sort of missing this interaction with, with people. So was it a, was, was, were you really, were you, were you challenged to go to dental school? Like, were you like, yes, I'm going to do it. Or uh, let me, let me throw out some feelers and see if it works. Where, where were you with that? No, then I was gung ho. I'm doing this. Doing I was it. committed. I was hundred percent right. committed and really fought hard to get to where I wanted to be. Again, I'm not a good test taker. I'm not in Mensa. This isn't coming natural to me. Well, if you were in Mensa, you wouldn't be on this podcast. Right, right. (laughs) That goes without saying. But I mean, I, in my brain, thought dentists and doctors were brilliant academically and, and I wasn't that student. And so... I fought really hard and general chem bio, it didn't really come naturally to me. The only thing that I loved and enjoyed of those academic classes, and I'm saying this to all the students that are listening, I only got A's in anatomy and organic chemistry. Why do you think that was? I don't even know. Well, for anatomy, it was the dissection, figuring out how things work. Again, I like to figure out how things work. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And in a puzzle. And I think organic chemistry is a puzzle. Oh, for sure. So what I me, remember of it. Right. So for me, that was not the way my brain thought. So mm-hmm. I was good at those things, yeah. but then you put, give me, you know, something else then I wasn't so great at it, but I didn't let that deter me to get through dental school. So once I started interviewing for dental schools, I narrowed it down to Maryland and Case Western. And you have to go visit the schools and you have to visit the students, do your research and figure out what it is you want. And back then when I was doing it, the research, the research I found was Maryland was a very um, big school on clinicians, like putting Mm -hmm. you into the clinical area quickly, like Mm -hmm. pushing you clinically. And there were some schools who pushed you with research. I went to Michigan and Michigan was a big research school. So we, we, that was a lot of our education. So I really wanted to be the clinician. I was like, I know I can do that. I know I have the skill sets to be an amazing clinician. If I'm trained correctly. Mm -hmm. And when I went to the school, I walked in and I just knew I had to be there. It was that feeling of this is where I'm supposed to come. And I did my interviews and the squeaky wheel kind of gets the oil. That's, that's just the way my parents raised me. So I would call the admissions office. I was like, did you see my chart yet? (laughs) Did you ever see my stuff? you know, I think this is a good point. And I did the same thing when I was at Michigan, I wanted to go to Michigan dental school. And so I would go and visit the academic advisor, the, the admissions um, director um, all the time. Don Strachan yes. was his name. And I'd be like, knock, knock, knock. Hey, Don, Dennis Hartley here. I know I won't be the first one in, but um, are you going to be able to find room for me? Um, and I think, so for those of you who are listening, it does make a difference. It does make a difference. So you don't want to be annoying. You don't want to pester. No. But you want to make sure that they know that you are, you're in it, that you're going to do what it takes to be successful. And right. they, they need to know that because right. it's really hard for these admission directors. They get so many applicants and on you paper, stand out. everyone looks the same. So yeah, right. you have to, you have to put yourself out there you and it's scary. It is scary, but, but you, you have to. And, and the thing is, if you, if you think about it, admissions to any type of thing, whether it's college or dental or medical or whatever, there's thousands of applicants. And how do you yeah. stand out? Because everyone's going to be basically a good student. Everyone's going to have the same, you know, I did tennis, I played piano. So for me, it was being um, one year out of college, I went back and said, I'm serious about this. Like I already took a gap year. Mm-hmm. I am going to be a professional, mature student. I would like to attend your school. I'm very interested. I know I'm out of state. 
However, this is the first dental school in the world. And that to me is a privilege to be able to attend this school. And I wanted to make it very clear. So I did call a few times. And so when the day I got the letter of acceptance, that was so great. And it was my first time living away from home too. Mm -hmm. And I remember Cecile being like, be mindful. Like Cecile wanted me to go to UIC. Sure. Cause she, local to Chicago. Right. And she's like, cause that's where you're networking. That's where yep. your network is. People know you. That's where you establish roots. And part of dentistry is networking, establishing re relationship with your colleagues. Isn't you that go, the truth? Isn't that the truth? She's like, no, you go so to Maryland and try to come back. It might be harder for you. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I said, I know Cecile, I get it. But I'm like, but you're here. <laughs> yeah, one person. Like, one person's a network. Like, right. So I was like, I know you. So so anyway, I took the chance and I, I went best experience ever, still in contact with my professors there, still email them, still see them if they're in the area and loved my education. And so fast forward, coming back to Chicago, I missed home. I wanted to go to children's, but when I applied, Dr. Gerardo was then the chairman. So yeah. immediately I was like, you know me, you already- no connection. Yeah, I'm like, you already know how I work, how, how you know, I was like, I was responsible. I showed up on time. I did everything you told me to. And I am, you've trained me before. I, I want in, I am all in, you know? Let, let, let's take course, a step back. I'm, I'm curious about when you're in dental school, because for, for those who are looking to get in or those who are in, um, everyone has a different experience in dental school. Um, I went to Michigan in the eighties and I tell you, it was, it, it was rugged. It was, um, it's the old style, old school style of teaching that fortunately yeah. I don't think is very prevalent any longer. And I would tell you, none of my classmates will look back fondly at the experience of dental school. Um, I look back fondly at what I learned in the dentist that I was able to become and the, the connections I made with my classmates. I love that. But dental school is pretty painful from a lot of our perspectives. But I think in the newer, newer generation, um, things are getting um, are, are much better. And I think it's more collegial. Um, I think things like the white coat ceremonies have been really helpful to give dignity to young dentists. And that wasn't really afforded back in the old days, you know. Um, so when you were in dental school, and, and I'm curious, because we're going to get into the mommy dentist and business, but I'm curious when you walked in, what was your class ratio of uh, females to males when you, when you walked in? Was it fairly even? Was it more highly male? Do you recall? From my recollection, I don't recall, but I, I do want to say it was at least between 30 and 40% women. Okay. So, it was, so uh, it, we had quite a few and for me, my experience was hard, like you said, where I was trained by a lot of Navy dentists, sure. just being yeah. in Maryland yeah. and in that, like in that area. And so we had a very strict, rigid program as well. And it was hard. And again, all the students listening out there, my first year after winter break, when I came back, one of my professors said, I'm surprised you're back. She said, I didn't think you were going to come back. It's hard. I struggled. I struggled with the academics. Yeah. The only thing I was good at was lab. That's what saved me as well. And yeah. The didactics so I, were not my, uh, were not my special, you know, were not my the forte. The didactics was not my forte. And, and the thing is, Dr. Sam Noon saved a whole jar of teeth for me that he extracted. I showed up <laughs> to school with this huge jar of teeth from centrals to canines, to premolars, to molars. And it, it was the coolest experience, but I struggled and where I shined was clinic. That's where yep. I shined. And I even finished all my requirements a semester early. Oh, that's great. And so that, that was really neat, but do you remember, do you remember what your first dental procedure was that you did on a living patient? Dentures. Okay. Right. Uh, that was my first, very first patient needed dentures. And he was an author of a book and he needed teeth to smile for his book. Oh, fantastic. His See? name was How rewarding Richard. was that? How rewarding was, was that? It was so rewarding. And he says to me, and he was the sweetest man alive. He says to me, have you done this before? <laughs> 
And I said, looked I, up, I, I looked dead in the eye and I said, yes, upstairs, <laughs> unfaked. Well, what I used to tell my students was when people ask you that, you say, I've done a number of these. Now the number could be zero. And it does, you know, you just, so, you know, you don't have to tell the whole truth. You just have to give a partial truth. I've done a number of these. And if you've done two, then you laugh. You say, well, I've done more than one of these and you've only done two. So, but that's okay. So you do have to embellish a little bit to get through the early days. So me being just so honest, I said, yep, upstairs and lab, <laughs> but anyway, but he didn't care. He was totally fine. But that, that was just, that was really super fun. I, I, I think dental patients themselves are angels talking about angels earlier. Oh, so the, the, the things they let us do to them. Uh, Grace, when you, when you were in, on, when you were in your undergrad dental school, did you know you wanted to go into pediatrics? Was your, was that sort of where you were, where you're shooting for right from the beginning or were you thinking also no. ortho or? I was thinking ortho. Th okay. I was thinking ortho, but then again, Cecile being ortho and then her brother, Tom being perio and dad being general, they were like, you should do pedo. Because they saw how you interacted with the children. Right. They, they said you were really good with children, but also because they were like, you know, there's a ton of us in different specialties. You should do pedo. And, yeah. and I felt like I was already maxed out with ortho. Like I felt like I already knew it. Like I, and during dental school, I worked in the private faculty practice for the chairman of ortho at Maryland, mm. Dr. Um, David. And um, so he wanted me, um, I volunteered my hours and I even got an award at graduation and I did ortho for the faculty practice. I worked with the residents. I mean, I knew how to put brackets on better than the residents. I was teaching the residents. And so then- was, was your thought then then, hey, I can do pedo and if I want to do ortho, I already yeah. have the skills to do ortho. Yeah, exactly. Okay. exactly. Yeah. So that's what I thought. And I figured I would at some point work with Cecile. But by the time I got back to Chicago, she was already selling her practice moving to the East Coast. So it never really panned out that mm. way. But I honestly didn't, I honestly didn't feel the need to learn more ortho. Sure. Makes but sense. I was exposed to then was the OR. As for, for pediatric dentistry. For pediatric dentistry. And that right. just blew my mind. I mean, general anesthesia and surgery. I was so excited. I was, oh, interesting. I was like, this is so cool. And that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be in the OR. Oh, interesting. Cause we did a bit of that when I did my residency on Mount Sinai on the West side of Chicago, we saw a lot of kids that needed, you know, tons of dentistry and they needed to have general anesthesia. So we did a lot in the OR back in the day. And I had sort of a different feeling about it. I was sort of like, I felt sad about it. And while, you know, it's, it's a great service. I mean, it's unbelievable because these kids are in pain. They have abscesses. They have multiple teeth that need to be removed. They need pulp stainless steel crowns. They need the, the whole shebang. Right. Um, but I was, I had sort of the opposite um, feeling. I'm like, I, I like the fact I got to do a lot of dentistry, but I really felt, I felt bad. I, I, I just, I just didn't, I didn't love the fact that we had, that these kids were in such need. And I had a hard time with yeah. that. So it's interesting yeah. to hear your perspective. And I get it. I get it because you get to do a lot of dentistry and really help in a really high level. High level, but also hone your skills. I mean, the oh, kids are sure. sleeping and not moving. Yeah, so that's you're, nice. You, you're, you're picking up speed. You're, you have three cases a day. Sometimes you have 12, 13 hour days in yeah. the OR. Yeah. But you are um, really learning dentistry, like your dentistry. You do a lot. Perfecting it. Yep. And so when you're doing it live on a live patient, you can do it confidently. I mean, mm -hmm. obviously they're moving around, but you don't have to get second guess your clinical right. skills. Right. So you know what to do. You know what to do. So that, that was really great. And I mean, and going back to dental school, had I not done pedo, I, I really loved oral surgery, but it was not committed to the length of training. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I looked forward to oral surgery so much. I loved going to oral surgery rotation and I had the best teachers there. Ah, that's great. Were, that makes yes, all the difference. Yes, they were intimidating. And yes, they yelled at you. And yes, they, you know, embarrassed sure. you. It's high stress, high stress it's, environment. It was very high stress environment. But my dad was a Marine. So I was like kind of used to like that disciplinary like mm -hmm. approach. And so I wasn't afraid of it, you know. So when I showed up, I they didn't have to handle me with cape gloves on. Like I was like, yes, sir. 
you know, whatever they threw at me, I didn't take it personally. And I really was taught oral surgery really well at Maryland. So when I got to pedo residency at Children's and we were putting kids to sleep, we were also, again, we are the specialist to see children, but we also needed to see the special needs children. And in a hospital setting, you were seeing all the special needs children. For sure, yeah. Up until 18, 19 right. as well. And maybe and so, even beyond, right? Because it's, it's, it's hard to find um, restorative dentists or general dentists who, who, yes. who will tr treat that population because there's, exactly. there's so many diff different demands. Exactly. And we had to extract adult teeth and I was very comfortable doing it. And we had an oral surgeon, um, gosh, I think his name is Dr. Mark Olson. Um, he's out in Carroll Stream. Oh gosh, I can't remember his last name. It's been so long, but- that Alexis Olson? No, Alexis Olson is Northwestern downtown. Northwestern, yeah. Mm -hmm. But we had another, he I had another attending at Lurie's and he only came so often. So we had to schedule these patients who needed extractions on the days he was there. Mm -hmm. And so it was a busy day for him. He was running from procedure suite to procedure suite. Sure. Doing these extractions because with the multiple residents going on. And, you know, one day he came in, I was with my attending and I said, I'm going to take these teeth out. He's like, are you sure? I said, yes, I can do it. So go ahead, go do it, you know? And so I was taking these teeth out. Dr. Mark walks in, he's like, I'm here. And I'm like, I'm done. And he said, what do you mean you're done? And I said, I just did it. He's like, he was so excited. He was like, I am so happy you did this. And I'm like, I didn't go to dental school not to learn how to pull teeth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I was just like, and I'm not here to not learn either. And if I pulled, if I was in the middle of pulling a tooth, and something went wrong. I knew you were here. I knew you would be here to help me. Yeah. But I'm not going to say no and shy away and back off because I'm afraid. And I tell residents all the time, this is when you are supposed to make your mistakes. And this is when you're supposed to learn. Well, I think that's the thing. I think sometimes people can be so afraid of making mistakes that they, they'll not step forward. Right. And I, you know, one thing you've talked about, and though you haven't used a word, is you've had a ton of mentorship. And it's, and I think that's a critical aspect when you're going through, you know, from de dental school, pre-dental school, all the way through as a dentist is finding people to mentor you and, Absolutely. and, and learn as, uh, as you're going through the process. Absolutely. And I encourage you to find that mentor, that teacher that you click with. You don't click with everyone. That's okay. There's millions of personalities out there, but find the couple of doctors in your school or in your residence that you click with and you ask them a bajillion questions questions yep. and you they are the, that's why they are there and teachers are saints as well because they don't really get paid much for this you know oh, they don't and, no. and they could very well be in private practice making a lot of money and they don't have to be there if they didn't want to be so that is how you learn mentorship is important but mentorship is important all throughout life any stage of life even now even now and and i remember one thing nancy told me nancy hajali told me when i was a resident she said grace you if you're going to have kids and you're going to get married someday you want to practice and live and where you practice you want to live close by and be in proximity because most often mothers are the primary caregivers of the children so if anything happens you want to be close by that's true. And Nancy did not follow that rule. So for those who don't know Nancy, Nancy practiced with me out in Winnetka and she lived quite a ways away, but that was, that was a challenge for sure. I think, right. I think that's really great advice for, you know, we'll talk about moms and moms in dentistry in just a yeah. bit, but I think that's really great advice for lots of, you know, for, and you know, the world's changing, right? I think, uh, and we'll talk about this. Males are becoming more sensitive and more, um, sure you know, more caring or becoming greater caregivers, but it still ultimately um, sort of falls on the mom's responsibility far too often. And I think that's great advice from Nancy. Yes. And I took that to heat and I really looked up to people and I took, I took everyone's advice and I said, there, there are people in your lives that tell you something and you can take it and receive it and do what you want. But the good advice, you really should consider it because yeah, oh, they're, not, sure. they're not telling it to you to ruin your life. They, they're telling it to you from their experience. 
in that experience, you can either just go and gain all that experience on your own, uh, right. or you can, and you know, for me, for a lot of times I would hear it and I'd still have to, I'd have to prove them right. You know, sure. I'd have to go through sure. it and say, well, yeah, they, they were right. But, right. and then I only had to do it once, you know, I didn't have to do it five <laughs> times. It's like, yes, that's exactly what they said would happen. And I won't do that anymore. Right. And so it did save me some, some learning, but I, with, for me, and as we talked about off air, um, and for those who've listened before, I joined Dr. M Buddy Mopper's practice. Buddy was a pediatric dentist uh, in the Chicago area, the North suburbs. And when I joined his practice, Nancy Hijawi, who you're just uh, referring to, I used to call her Nopra, by the way, the, <laughs> the Nancy Oprah, because um, Nancy just had great wisdom. She was very, very yes. Oprah-like in her, in her thoughts. And so I joined a practice that had a pediatric dentist uh, full-time. And we were doing cosmetic dentistry and sharing a space. And it was a very interesting dynamics. But I, I, I have to ask you this because I want to start talking about mommy, dentists and business. But I want to ask about managing, it seemed to me, it seemed to me, and we do a lot of aesthetics uh, on, on kids. And I will say this, anyone who loves doing cosmetic dentistry, one of the things that's been really successful in my practice is reaching out to my pediatric dentists and helping them with some of these challenging cases, peg laterals, congenitally missing laterals, malformed teeth, uh, fractured incisors. Um, a traditional typical pediatric practice is seen you know, more about volume, right? There's a lot of kids, there's a lot of action. They've got three hygienists that are running. They got a lot going on. It's, I think, difficult to spend an hour and a half doing a specific procedure on, on a youngster where that's the nature of our practice in cosmetics, you know, for me to have a seven hour right. patient is typical, um, to do two hours, to do bonding, do layered bonding. That's sort of what we do. And so my biggest referral is actually pediatric dentists. Um, and so for anyone listening out there, you want to do cosmetic dentistry, get the skills and then reach out to your orthodontist or reach out to your pediatric dentist yes. and they will, they will help you build your practice. And once you start working on the kids, well, guess who else has peg laterals? Well, mom or dad did. And yeah. who else has a bad smile because of that? Cause it was done, you know, maybe not ideally. And it's what really what blew, um, blew up my practice was just working with Nancy first and then Dr. Simone Malou and other, other pediatric dentists in the community who's trusted me to work on the Absolutely. patients. So, Absolutely. um, I wanted to ask though, and I apologize, I sort of got off on that little tangent. It seemed to me working with Nancy and others that the challenge wasn't as much the kids as it was the parents. Um, <laughs> is, that, is that my appreciation or now, what, 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 what can you say about that? I'm, I'm, for it's those who are true. going into pediatrics or even into dentistry and are gonna be working on kids, Tell me about the interaction between the provider and the parent of the kid you're working on. That's a very loaded question. It and, is. Yeah, I purposely. A, not, but, but you're not practicing sure. now, so you can be maybe sure. a little more forthright, right? Absolutely. And as I formulate my thoughts on how to answer this. Trying in to be diplomatic. Yeah, a politically PC way. But I, I, I have to say. And you're a mom, but you're a, you're a parent, right? I'm a, I'm parent. a parent. I'm a how, parent also. There's been a big shift. So having practiced now for a very long time in treating patients from a dental assistant standpoint and a doctor standpoint, it really depends on the generation in, in the parenting styles. There are many parenting styles. For sure. And now my oldest patient is like 30 and, and she wouldn't leave me. And I said, right. but she had no problems, right? She was really healthy. So I said, yep. as, as soon as you have a problem, you're going. And I've noticed the parenting styles shifting. So my older patients that are in their you know, late 20s, when I knew them way back when they were children long, long ago, yep. the parents would drop them off and leave. Right. right? Well, I, I heard in an interview you did, you were talking about being a latchkey kid. And, you know, and I was as well. And you made a point, you'd be arrested today if, right. if we treated our kids like we were treated, right? Right, right. And so Social it was, service would be at your door so right. fast. DCFS would be like, you're gone. Exactly. I'm coming to get your kid. And so the, the, ch the children were just dropped off and they, they'd say, okay, Dr. Young, just call me. You have my number. And I, I need to go shopping for groceries or I need to go right. pick up the other kid at soccer and I'll be back. So it was so different. But then as the mothers 
got younger and younger, I noticed a different shift. And I'm not saying Gen Z, millennial or whatever, but as the mothers got younger, the parenting styles were shifting, right? Sure. So then yeah. it was the parent that was a nervous Nelly, like everything made them nervous and everything was a question. And then it was also then the whole shift in, in nutrition in America, carbs are bad. Everything's organic. What's going on in the mouth? And then also you, as dentists and doctors, we have noticed an increase in peanut allergies, mm -hmm. you know, sure. latex allergies, for sure, autism. In my scope, in my vision of what I've seen in the past 20 something years, every 10, five years, maybe there's a shift, there's a change. And so there are parents who are justifiably nervous because their kid might have an anaphylactic reaction. For sure. Yep. So that's warranted. I get that. But the management of the parent oftentimes is just as challenging as managing a patient's behavior in the dental chair and doing the dental procedure. So as pediatric dentists, we're having to manage a lot more, right? And you got to do it at the same time. That's the issue. You do it at the same it? time. Right? You got right. the parent sitting here holding the kid's hand. Right, right, right. right. And then you on build Google, On Google asking you, what, what, what material right. are you using there? Right, right, right. And they think that they know everything. But but then I, in my, what I have learned and what I tell my associates is you have to train the parent how to treat you. I think that's a great, that's great advice. So you have to lay down the law in a gentle and firm way. Like, this is how I do things. And if you aren't comfortable, then I have to refer you to a different pediatric dentist. So if you can't do it the way I want it done and the way I do it safely for your child, then you need to go somewhere else. And that's okay. For example, nitrous oxide or restorative patients, right? Mm -hmm. Oftentimes a child's behavior will be skewed when a parent is in the room. And I tell a parent, you leave your child starting kindergarten, age five at school, they separate from you for many hours. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like that. They are only with me for 30 minutes. You can have that separation, but you need to trust me. I'm not going to force your child or do anything that they don't want to do. And if we need you, we will come get you. You know, and it's how, did, how, how did you find the parents generally responded to that? So generally they say, okay. And I have to reassure them, you know, it's the communication. It's reassuring the parent, reassurance, reassurance, reassurance saying, I have a window. I'm going to shut the door, but there's a window and you can look through the window. If you feel that you need to be right there, you cannot be literally physically in the room, breathing on top of me. And I tell them when parents are in the room with me, I get distracted because guess what? You ask me 10,000 questions and then guess what? Your child is on nitrous oxide longer than they have to be because I have to stop and answer your question. And then yeah. I can't get my work done. And I was like, if you want me to do the best clinical work for your child, you have to leave me alone. It's so interesting to me that people would, that the parents want to be in the treatment room and they would never be in a treatment room if your kid was getting scoped for a knee injury. Right. Um, they're, you know, and like you said, they, they don't join them at school. But for some reason, there is a sense that they need to be there holding their kid's hand. And the anxiety of the parent heightens the anxiety of the kid. And it exactly. just becomes even more of a, a challenge. Exactly. Um, yeah. And th this is, and truly, I, I mean, I love children and uh, blessed to have one. And I, the group that I've really become really fascinated by and love treating them, the, the young adults, the high school age. Yes a group that I never would have liked until I started getting to understand a little love bit more of the emotions, love right? Them. Um, but it is really, it's, uh, I think getting the parent to separate to allow you to be able to have the one-on-one -on -one relationship that you need to be able to do the dentistry at your highest level is so critical, but boy, it's such a challenge. I, I, I applaud you all on your daily, on your daily events of trying to manage that. It is. But after a while, you know, once you build rapport and they trust you, mm -hmm. it is all about trust. It's all about trust, you know, and it could be even in the same office with different providers. Right. So yeah. I think that one way or another, it, it got to the point where it was weird for me where I own the practice, but it got to the point where there are new patients that I didn't even know, but they were seeing the associates. Mm -hmm. And if the sure. associate was sick and I filled in, they'd be like, who are you? Yeah. Oh, I've seen the <laughs> same thing in my practice for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm the guy with the gray hair. <laughs> I've been around for a while. I'm like, yeah. I'm no one. Don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah. No, same thing. Yeah. I get that.
All right. Well, listen, thanks, uh, dental line trainers. This has been super, for me, super interesting talking to Grace because, well, I love talking dentistry and a truly uh, pediatric dentist, uh, you, you, you have a special place in heaven. Uh, okay. So uh, we're going we're gonna to pick up our next session, our second part of the interview, when we're going to talk about Mommy's Dentist and Business, MD, MDIB. Um, MDIB. MDIB. MDIBs. <laughs> MDIBs. That's right. MDIBs.com. MDIBs. Mm -hmm. All right. So check us out on part two of our interview and look forward to seeing you at the next session. So Grace, thanks. And we'll pick this up Thank on you. our next podcast. Perfect. Hey, Dental Online Trainers, thanks for listening. Look, if you enjoyed our conversation with Grace, and I hope you don't mind the little, little segue we took down memory lane with some of our common colleagues and influences in dentistry. It was really fun listening to some of the names that Grace brought up, and they were very influential in me and the dentistry that I got to do and the practice that I'm in. Well, listen, look forward to part two of our conversation where we talk more about MDIB or Mommy Dentist and Business and Grace's inspiration to begin that new business. So look, if you love our Sharecast, please tell your friends. And you know what? Send them a link. And don't forget to give us that coveted five-star rating wherever you listen to your podcasts. Finally, if you're not a member of Dental Online Training, check us out at dothandson.com for information about our live virtual courses. And by the way, we have our CPR for the Warren Dentition course coming up at the end of March. I think it's March 24th and 25th, 2022. Um, we have our recorded hands-on courses. So you can do these courses in the comfort of your own practice on your time, on your schedule, at your pace. We have our blogs, our mini tips, our recorded webinars, and, and so much more. Well, listen, until next time, I'm Dr. Dennis Hartlieb, yours for better dentistry. Hey, Dental Online Trainers, thanks for joining us. Today's Sharecast is with Dr. Grace Yum, pediatric dentist and founder of Mommy Dentist and Business. In our previous conversation, Grace shares her story about what inspired her to start Mommy Dentist and Business, a place for dentists who are also mothers. It's a gathering place for Mommy Dentists to meet, to support each other with the challenges of running a household and running a dental practice. Grace talks about the need for supportive communities of dentists where there's space for collaboration instead of competition. She also shares about juggling all the different aspects of her life as best she can and how she views the importance of getting help when needed to keep everything running smoothly. So listen, kick back and relax and enjoy my little conversation with Dr. Grace Yum, founder of Mommy Dentist and Business. Hello, dental online trainer, Dr. Dennis Hartley, back with you again for part two of our conversation with Dr. Grace Yum. Yum, right? Yum, yum, yum. yum. <laughs> I'm either supposed to be a dentist or a chef. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Maybe a little bit of both. Uh, if you did not listen to part one, I encourage you to go listen to part one of our interview because you get to listen to Grace's background, uh, how she got influenced to go into dentistry. And so interesting in all these interviews I've done, it's so interesting to hear the person that influenced the, the, per, the dentist that got them into dentistry. And Grace is no exception. You'll hear her background. You'll learn how she got into pediatric dentistry and some of the, some of the challenges uh, being a pediatric dentist. So it's a great little conversation that we had. The second part of our conversation is going to be about an organization that Grace started back in 2017 uh, mommy Dentist and Business, or you can find it at mommydib.com, correct? Yes, Dan, that's correct. Yeah. Um, and I think it's just fascinating. And so, Grace, if you can sort of jump in, uh, tell me your inspiration of, like, just bring me back. So what, what, what was going on? Absolutely. Great question, Dennis. Four years ago, I was practicing dentistry full-time. Monday through Thursday, two Saturdays a month, teaching residents. I had one resident from each program, actually, UIC and Lurie's, rotating through on Saturdays. And I was about to, or thinking about opening a third location in the Western suburbs. Mm. My city practice was great because it was like the flagship sure. office. And yep. lots of new families, young couples, one child getting to, then they moved to the suburbs because they need a big house. Most went to the North Shore. I would say about 70%, then 30% would then go to Hinsdale. 
which is out west, west for our listeners. Yeah. Yes. So I was tracking where my patients were going. Some would come back to the city every six sure. months, but then some wanted and asked, can you open another practice North Shore? Right. So that's what stimulated my practice being open in Glenview. So when I did that, before I did that, there was a practice that I could rent. So I rented a small two office practice because one of my attendings at Lurie's was Dr. Frank Vacari. Dr. Vacari is a plastic surgeon, but I met him on the cleft palate team. Mm. So Dr. Vacari's wife, Dr. Janice Vacari on Waukegan Road mm -hmm. has this really small, cute little office where she works out of three times a week when she wants and otherwise it's sitting empty. Mm. So she let me rent her practice so that I could see if patients were coming. Yeah, so that's, that's a great way to do it. Yeah, so I did that. Did you have associates at the time, Grace, or were you on your own? I, I did, I had, um, I had an associate and um, I don't remember how many, but I was running my first practice for four years before I decided to venture off to the second practice. And I, I was already pregnant with my second child opening up the Glenview practice. And how, old, how old was your first child? Two, 20 months old. And okay. so the funny thing is in Pedo, there's really not many practices to buy. Right. So I had to build from scratch both practices and that, that was great. I, I enjoyed it. And when the second practice was about four years old, I was thinking about opening up the one in Hinsdale. However, at that time, being a mom, being a practice owner, I couldn't make all the dental meetings. It was very hard to go to a meeting at six o'clock at night. I'd be driving to Old Orchard to go to Maggiano's for a meeting, but then I get a call from my nanny saying, your daughter has a fever of 102 and your husband's out of town for work. You need to come home. Right. She's crying. So then I'm turning the wheel and I got to go home and I can't make all these meetings. For sure. So then I found an online community in Facebook. There were many dental Facebook groups that I learned so much. I never went to dental town. I was in many Facebook dental groups, but then I felt it very awkward to ask questions that pertain to mothers in dentistry mm -hmm. because I didn't think our male colleagues could really understand what we were going through. One time I threw out a question in a forum and I said something about how do you handle your schedule if you have to pick up your kids and you're missing all their sports activities and games and, and everything like that. And the women were chiming in trying to help answer the question, but the men would chime in and say, oh gosh, I'm so glad I don't have to deal with that. My wife deals uh, with that. Oh, interesting. And so I was like, you know, thank you for answering, but you really didn't have to answer because it's really not pointed at you, but thank you for answering. <laughs> like, I don't have a wife. <laughs> right, 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 right. So yeah, that's the reality. Right. So it was interesting because I felt that again, some of the questions other women asked, our male colleagues would start to be condescending and answer in kind of a mean way or aggressive way. And I noticed that more and more women were backing out asking questions. Because they didn't want to get that that feedback from these male dentists that were maybe not sensitive to the reality right. of you know, right. a mom and a dentist. Right. And or aggressive. You know, nobody wants to be treated aggressively. And on a keyboard when you're typing, you don't hear the tone of voice, yeah. right? You don't know if they're joking. Right. right. You don't know if it's like in a chuckled way or right. Is it sarcasm so, or is it just mean spirited or what is right, it? Right. You don't know. You can't tell. And oftentimes you don't know who they are. For sure. Like they're, hidden. In, they're hidden. But in Glenview, we all know each other, right? We all know so and so and so and so and so and so. So when we interact, we know each other. Right. But if you're talking to a doctor from Washington, D.C. that you don't you don't even know anything about. Right. It's hard to understand. So I decided why not come out with my own Facebook group and make it for mothers because there's no place for mothers and mothers have a different challenge. We honestly do. So I ventured off, created this group called mommy dentist in business because that's what I identified with all the hats that I wore. Mommy, I'm a dentist, I'm in business. So those mm -hmm. are the three identifiers. 
I only started with 50 people of my own friends, dental school friends, colleagues that I knew and referrals. One thing led to another. People were saying, this is great. We're really helping each other. Okay, can I ask you a question, Grace, before you go on? And I'm sorry yeah. to interrupt. Sure. When, when you first started, so I, I think this is, I, I think it's exceptional. And I, um, I'm surrounded by really Thank incredible you. women dentists and many, many are uh, moms. Um, and, you know, and I, I don't want to say that I'm fortunate. It's not that I'm fortunate or unfortunate. I'm a male in a very male, male driven, you know, profession, though it, that's, that's changing quickly, right? I mean, classes yes. now are 50-50 right. um, or more. Um, I'm, I, and I, I hate to go back to this, but, but I, I feel the need to. So you talk about this sort of online format where like you have a real, you have a real issue. You got a question. You need, you need, you need some advice. You need mentorship, right? right? right. And you're, you're in this community where there's, you know, un, insensitive or non, uh, unsensitive, insensitive males. I want to go back to dental school because I'm very curious and I ask a lot of my female colleagues this. Did you feel the same sort of insensitivity when you're in dental school being a female in this very male centric no. profession? Not okay. in school. No. Okay. Not so it's sort of in this hidden, this hidden format where people where you're in this, this uh, in this Facebook group and people or whatever the community was. Um, and, and that's so unfortunate. It's uh, it's terrible as a male that we're that we're not more heightened in our awareness and sensitive um, but I applaud you for, for making, making a format or find, you know, creating a format for people to be, for women, women moms, to be able to speak freely and, and openly and honestly. That's, that's got to be very liberating. That's got to be really, it's, it's got to be incredibly refreshing and liberating for women to be able to have that format. It is, it is. And to get the feedback, it's been four years. It, it went by very quickly. But again, I love helping people. And if I get an email or a letter in the mail or someone messaging me about how it's changed their life, how it's made them a better dentist, a better mom, how they feel supported, how they feel they finally have people that understand them, the camaraderie. And some of the things that men don't understand about women or oh, there's a lot. There's a, There's a lot. We, we, don't, we don't have that There's much time. A, Give me just a few. But but one example would be that if, let's say, Dennis, your wife, maybe she is an accountant or maybe, or maybe she decides to work in the home. The role is different in that, especially with school and kids at school. Yep. There's a lot of- No doubt stress and pressure to be that mom at school, right? The kids are like, well, how can, you know, Carter's mom comes to school all the time and does everything with us. How, you're not on field trips. You don't come and do the bake sale. You, where are you? And there's this pressure of like, oh my God, you know, or you missed out on the play. Where were you? And this is called mom guilt. For sure. And dads may or may not feel that much guilt. They might feel some guilt, but it's not on the same level as mom guilt. <laughs> sure, I bet, and, I bet so. I mean, I felt guilty. I hated that I couldn't be a homeroom parent for my daughter when she sure. was a kid. I hated it, but sure. I, I would not deny that the amount of guilt that I suffer as a male is far different than, than as a mom. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't argue that at all. Society puts a lot more pressure on the mom when it comes to children. Yep. And so if, if something happens at school, oftentimes the moms get blamed for it. Right. Sure. Or you didn't teach your child this, right? Mm -hmm. Like even down to manners, like chewing with your mouth closed or saying thank you, shaking hands and looking someone in the eye. Little, even little things like that. Like education starts at home and you didn't educate your child. So all of this is culminating, is especially for mothers who just gave birth. You know, most societies outside the US, they have a six month leave. Right. Here, it's like you're back to work in six weeks. Dentists, I know, two weeks. Yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> you know, if we're as a dentist, you're not, you're not taking six weeks as a dentist typically. No. So yeah. if, if you're a practice owner, right. no. no. You know, and even after I gave birth, I had my office manager bringing me stuff from the office every day. For sure. So it was, um, or it is a challenge for moms and work that work-life balance, but also that need of camaraderie and women comparing themselves or not having that friendship with other moms in their schools. So it's, it's like, oh, well, 
you know, I'm a stay at home mom, but you're a dentist. And, and so you're intimidating to be a friend with, or some of the dentist moms or mommy dentists will say, I have nothing in common with this lady. She um, may not have gone to college or she may not be on the same education level. So there's this, like, I don't connect with some of these women. And, and dentistry is uh, unique in that you, you have to have your hands in somebody's mouth to be right. able to be running your business. And so it could be someone who's, they could be another professional, they could be an attorney, but an attorney sitting at their desk and they are, they got their phone right next to them. We don't have our phones next to them. No. Right? No. We no. have a different, and so it is difficult, even like as a male dentist, my friends are like, you know, I, eat, I texted you like four hours ago. It's like, yeah, my hands were in someone's mouth, dude. Right. While you're just sitting on your computer, I'm actually, you know, I'm, I'm occupied. And I think right. that's, that's super, that's super important because people don't understand that you're not just at a beck and call when you're, when you're serving your patients. Right. right? right. So it doesn't matter if male or female, if they're in other, other worlds, they just don't get it. They don't get it. And you have to be a dentist to get it, you know, and I actually on my, on my Instagram, I have all these little funny videos of memes of mom's life, right? One, one I just did was, Hey, don't feel badly if the school nurse calls and the front desk is like the school nurse says you got to pick up the kid and you send your dental assistant to pick up the kid because what are you going to do <laughs> what are you going to do you can't just leave and daddy can't just leave and so the next best thing is to send your dental assistant to go pick up the kid and bring him home or bring him to the office sick you know your don't proxy. feel badly you know right your mom like, proxy it's the mom it's, so it's kind of like we have to joke about it and, and make light of it at the same time, because, Hey, don't feel badly. If you know, you forgot to take your kid to the birthday party on Saturday, I have sent my husband. So at my house, I'm also the social secretary, right? Yeah. So I have to keep track of everyone's social activities, sure. including date night and yeah. kids activities and birthdays. I have to work Saturday. So I tell my husband, I text him, take Zoe to this, to the beach party, Montrose beach at 10 AM. And I, again, I'm in someone's mouth. So I can't check my phone until 3 p.m. Right. I look at my text. It's 10 a.m. My husband goes, the party was yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm standing at Montrose Beach. Here are pictures of me and Zoe at the beach. <laughs> We're having a lovely time. <laughs> right. Picking up the scraps. So. I think that you give a lot of um, credit. It's it's. it's it's got to be really great for other moms to be able to have a resource to say, all right, I don't have to be perfect. Um, I, you know, you, you, I, I read something you wrote or that you said, it's okay to go to Target and get something, put it on them and send them off to school. It's okay not to be perfect. Um, there's a lot of pressure on women to be perfect. I think that it's one thing for the media to say it. it's one thing for say, you know, a male to say it. It's a different thing for a female colleague living the same life to understand and hear it from them and say, you don't have to be perfect. You don't have to be perfect. And you know, that it just reminded me, my friend who's a pediatrician, same problems, right? Yeah, She's a sure. pediatrician. Absolutely. Her son had, to, um, it was like international day, like wear something representative of your ethnic history or whatnot. She was, she's Chinese. So she didn't have time and she forgot like it, of it's course. like Monday, you know, 8 a.m. And her son's like, mom, what am I wearing to school? And she was like, oh my God, she found a red shirt. She cut a yellow, whatever the Chinese flag is, it's yellow and red. So she said right. she took construction paper, <laughs> cut out the things and she took a safety pin and safety pin to the shirt. <laughs> said, here you go. You're Success. going to school like this. Success. You know, and, and then of course, kids show up in these elaborate <laughs> clothes, you know, just elaborate. Yeah. And, and you just do the best you can. And, and as long as your kid shows up and has something, you know, it builds character, it builds grit. They'll builds, be okay. <laughs> yeah, right. Grit, right? You need grit. Tell me more about uh, mommy's dentist in business. So like you guys dentist... are doing, you're doing so much. I mean, so can I ask, actually, before we jump into that, can I, I want to ask you something different. I, I don't believe in work-life balance. I believe sure. in, I believe in work-life integration um, because I love what I do. I love being a dentist and I love teaching. And um, if you were to look around in my basement right now, you'd see all the models I have put out for the next course we're going to do. 
And I, I, I had a hard time with the concept of balance because I, I always felt out of balance until I heard someone talk about integration and accepting that who I am is I'm, I'm a dad, um, I'm divorced, so, but I was a parent, I, was, uh, I am a parent, I was a spouse, I have a partner now, um, and I'm a dentist, and I'm a teacher, and I'm a mentor, and there's other things, right? So it's all sort of integrating all that stuff, right? Absolutely. So, but talk about for, I mean, you, you've been at it for a while, so talk about balance or integration, or how do you describe it, and how do you, wh- what thoughts do you have about that? Yeah, that's a great question. People ask all the time, how do you sure. balance? I call it the juggle. Mm-hmm. And I say to people, it's never quite balanced. Balance means you're at equilibrium. Right. You can't forever be there. You're either up or you're down or you're teetering or you're, you're in the wobble. And for me, my perspective is it's a juggling act. And if you think about a circus act and the, the people that spin the plates on those skinny- Love it. I love little those poles. things. Yep. As a mom, I am spinning 10 plates in the air and one will eventually drop and that's okay and it'll shatter, but the show must go on. You still have to go on. So it is a, an act, you know, and, and as, as you know, even around many pediatric dentists, when we show up to work, it's an act every day, no matter how much is going on in your life, no matter what sorrow you're feeling because something happened externally, you show up to work and all of a sudden it's Disney World. You're on stage, man. It is on. Dentistry, dentistry, you you are, you have to be, you're on show. Doesn't matter if you're doing kids or adults, man, you come in, you can be having the worst day. How's your day, doc? My day's great. How's your day? Yeah. That's all, that's all you can say. You have to, you have to work with blinders on and you have to leave whatever you're feeling at the door and compartmentalize. And so I I feel like as moms, we do a good job of juggling and we multitask. And, and so sometimes we don't do one thing that well, like when you have too much going on, you drop in the the plates are falling. That's when you have to think about, okay, I need prioritize. I need to help myself so that not everything's falling off. And that means hiring help. That means getting assistance. That means being not in control of everything. You cannot control everything and you cannot please everyone. And as soon as you understand that and give yourself some grace, you'll feel much better about yourself and how you're doing and, and that mental clarity because it's physical. Dentistry is very physical, as you know. Oh, incredibly physical. You know, it's incredibly physical. And dentistry is emotional yeah, so. and lots of stress. Dentistry is also has great satisfaction in how you're helping people. But I, I think for moms being emotional creatures, women being emotional creatures, I'm not saying men are not, but I think that women have to work on balancing your emotions and your health, because if you can't be at optimal condition for yourself, you can't help somebody else. And like everyone says, you know, the airplane thing with the oxygen mask, you have to put it on for yourself before you can put it on somebody else. It's the same concept. So my thing is women in your thirties or forties or fifties say, focus on your health, your physical health, because if you are not in good physical, optimal health, you cannot practice dentistry. You cannot, you cannot run around with your kids and your health in your forties is the gateway to your health in the fifties and sixties. So if you're not mindful and you wreck your body now, what are you going to look like in 10 years? Yeah. And how are you going to do your career? And for those who are young dentists, I can tell you, I'm nearing 60. I started doing yoga about a decade ago. Good for you. it, it, It saved me in practice because I was just having such a challenge. Um, and so I think for all dentists, you have to, you have to be physically fit to do. It's a demanding, demanding profession. It's, it's demanding. And like you said about integration, you need to integrate that. It is crucial. Exercise is crucial to that integration of longevity in your practice and your family life and find the time, the complaint that mothers have. I don't have time. To- There's no time. There's no time. No time. Right. You have so how do you so how do you respond to that? How do you So this is how I this is my response. You have to schedule it like you schedule a patient. You have to schedule it 
and you have to commit to it and find someone that's going to hold you accountable, Mm. whether it's your spouse or whether it's a girlfriend, whether it's a personal trainer, people say to me, I can't afford this. People think, oh my God, a personal trainer. Oh my God, a private yoga instructor. Oh my God, a personal assistant. They think those are luxuries. They think that that's like for somebody who's so wealthy and rich. Mm -hmm. And I say, look, other people think you are wealthy and rich. You're a doctor. Right. You know, it's about mindset. And I said, if you do the math, let's say you have your, uh, someone on your street, maybe a teenager who's like 14, 15 years old, come over after school, help with the homework. If your kids are little, right. Maybe help with meal prep or do the laundry, all the things that you don't really have to do. You think you have to do it, but you don't have to do it. And that's what maybe $200 a week, but guess what? That saves five hours of your week. You right. could be going on a walk. You could be going on a jog. You could be doing yoga at your house. That $500 a week extra that you're spending, that's like com- compared to, a two, to one service or two surface filling. All you have to do is one filling a week, right. one extra filling a week. That's yep. all that it costs for you to have some healthy boundaries in your life. That's great. That's great advice. I think that's because I think everyone falls into that, right? I can't afford it. I don't have the time. There's nowhere to nowhere to do that. But if you don't, then you're going to drop the plates. You're going to drop right? the and, plates. And then what's left? Then how do you manage that? Right? right now, you're not able to serve your patients. You're not able to serve your family. You're not able to serve yourself. Right. And right. And th- and some some moms are widows. Some moms are divorced and single. Right? Mm-hmm. Some moms decide to do it by themselves. Yeah. So they are the breadwinner. And, yep. and I say, you know, you are the breadwinner. You're also the primary caregiver. Yep. So if you don't take the time for yourself, you won't have the resources later. Like, what are you going to do? Right. And you're not, and you're not going to enjoy the, the journey. Right. And I mean, at my age, you know, it's, <laughs> it's looking back and understanding the the journey is, is really the, the whole thing. And uh, you know, you get the days, uh, the days are long, the years are short, and it becomes more evident as, you know, as I, as I get a little bit up there and get a little more gray hair and Absolutely. lose a little more hair. Absolutely. Tell me, tell me, you guys have so much going on. You have a great podcast. You guys have events to um, talk about beyond the, the, the form, the forum that you have, which I've heard is just wonderful. Um, tell us about the other stuff that you guys are doing. So mommy dentist in business really was organically born. I knew nothing about what it was going to be. My intent was just support. And we were learning so much from each other. The comments were, we should be earning CE. So why not? You should be earning CE. So I looked into it and got accredited by the AGD Pace to Mm -hmm. offer CE. And then one thing led to another, led to another podcasts, webinars, meetings, newsletters, events, I mean, it, it goes on and on and it's become a sorority and it's even spread to Canada. And now we have these regional groups, like affinity groups, I call them, and we have volunteer leaders and they step up and they get together and they do their gatherings if they can, you right. know, with In COVID, the safest vessels. Yep. So they, they do that and it was all born organically. I, I never knew it would be such a thing. I offer a subscription model. So you pay an annual fee of $635. Sounds like and a great bargain. With that, you get all the CE for free and now you get discounts. I have partnered with 60 different companies. I would say it's about 40, 60% split, 60% dental supply companies and dental related, 40% lifestyle, meaning mm-hmm. William Sonoma, Harry and David, things that mothers purchase Need. from sure. you know we've done things with revlon we've done things you know so things that the other dental organizations don't offer essentially sure. yeah. so so um now dental distributors and companies treat me like a dso almost even though i'm not sure. so they give me gpo pricing and lock me in at a price an point and yeah so we have a formulary so they call me a hybrid in that um i'm somewhat influencer but somewhat you know um 
a large business that we do right. B2B business with. Sure. So it's a hybrid plan. And those that are practice owners got to take advantage of all the discounts and CE for and so it works out, you know, great. And and we have a directory in our we have a private portal and we track everyone's CE. Just the other day I was on the phone phone with the California uh, State Dental Board to uh, confirm another a doctor's CE. Sure. And so I was able to do that. And, and it's become a business. It's become a business and it's taken up that? all my, all my time. And you know, I'm very passionate about it. And, and as you've heard with the story, I've had great mentors and my whole heart, I believe in paying it forward. And in my dental, I want to call it legacy. I have brought up five other women Two oh. have gone to hygiene school. And then I have three, well, actually four more. Four have become dentists. Oh, that's fantastic. One is a pediatric dentist now. I just got a text message from one of my assistants um, who went to Michigan. She's at Michigan oh, right okay. now, okay. Carly, Carly Fox. And she got accepted by Dr. Ray Gerardo. She will be oh. starting pedo at Lurie's next fantastic. fall. Fantastic, that's and awesome. And she just texted me. She said, I matched, I matched. And I said, oh, amazing. So I love helping others the way I was helped along the way. So I think that's really important. Can I ask a question? You brought up the, these little groups, these little pods that are um, around the country. Those are where, where women will meet and, and meet together. And is it just, uh, is it just, uh, um, just for collaboration, just to like, hey, here's, you're not alone in this very yes. busy dental world that we all yes. live in. And let's just go have, let's go have a, a cocktail. Let's go have a yeah. glass of wine. Yeah. Let's go, you know, see yeah. a movie. Let's go do whatever. Is, yeah. that, is that the yeah. idea? It's just a social Break down some barriers. The regional Facebook groups, we call them, are divided into areas where there's a big population of dentists. So sometimes it's by state or region, and sometimes it's literally by city. So there are a huge number of dentists in Texas. Houston has its own Facebook group. Austin, Dallas. San Francisco, San Diego, Chicago, but actually Chicago, Illinois is grouped with Wisconsin and um, Ohio. Okay. Michigan has its own. So the doctors will get together and have a social gathering just to say, hey, we're in this together yeah. and we are collaborating. And it, that's basically all that it is. And it's just to celebrate each other. Yeah. And they'll post things like, you know what, I am having to go on maternity leave, or I have to have surgery on my ankle, or hey, my uh, one thing that happened just recently, my husband has COVID, and he's in the hospital, can someone please help me manage, work my office for the next couple of weeks? Oh, how fantastic. Can, can temp for me. Hey, I have a hygienist who's looking for more hours. I only need her for two days. Does anyone need a hygienist? What a, so great, we help, what a great format. We all help each other. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what it's about is rather than competing, mm -hmm. we're collaborating because of the mindset of there's enough for everybody. There's enough teeth in the world that we don't have to worry about that. Yeah. Uh, I, I can't thank you enough. I, I want, oh, any, any event that's coming up that you want to let, uh, let our viewers, listeners uh, be aware of as um, things are coming along. Oh, yeah, sure. We do three events a year. One is our CEO roundtable, which is intimate, less than 50 doctors. That's in Laguna Beach coming up in May. We have a clinical event that's held at Visco, March 31st. Awesome. And that is going to be about 70 doctors. And then our large annual event is in October. It's uh, in Las Vegas. And that's more of a social event. And we do have CE for it, but we have different types of speakers. And so that's always going to be so fun. Uh, you know, but one thing that I wanted to end uh, with you on this podcast is share with everyone, one of my role models, I would say, or people that I look up to outside of dentistry on how to run a business is Isidore Sharp. He is the founder of the Four Seasons Hotels and Resorts. Yeah. And I've modeled my business since I was a resident after his, because of my patients, I always ask them where they go on vacation. And they always say, it's at the Four Seasons in Hawaii or Four Seasons. And I was like, I've never been to the Four Seasons. You know? So I, yeah. I, I would try to go and check it out. Of course, it's, it's expensive. But now I realized why they pay that. 
Yeah. Why are they paying all this money to go to the Four Seasons and then you see? And I get the Four Seasons magazine. And so I just recently got one last month and I wanted to share an excerpt oh, from it, too. if you will. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And for our listeners, and Grace, you may be interested, we just had uh, Mr. Todd Williams on our Sharecast, and uh, he just did a webinar with us. And Todd was the lead trainer for Four Seasons Hotels for a long, long time. He's actually coming to my study club on Friday to do, oh, no um, way. Yeah, do yeah. training with us this, uh, this week. Um, That's wonderful. So yeah, Todd is... Yeah, he's, uh, he talks about the Four Seasons way, and he's one of the best story storytellers, if not the very be best storyteller I've ever heard in my life. He's, in he's just incredible. So um, for, our, for our listeners, check that out, because Todd's really phenomenal. And so yeah, you brought up Four Seasons, so I'm ready. Oh, good. I'm so glad. And I mean, I read Isidore Sharp's book, his um, autobiography as well. Mm -hmm. And one thing that uh, it I loved in this magazine, and I'm going to quote him on this because, you know, he's 90. Yeah. You know, when people reach 40, 50, they always think they are getting older. Well, yes, and it's good to get older, but you don't have to get old. The recipe for not getting old, as those wiser than I have said, is always finding much to be grateful for, to be curious about, to take pride in, to enjoy. And that really resonated with me because as dentists, we are all high achievers and we're always thinking about what are we going to do next? What are we going to do next? And sometimes we don't take a moment to think about what we've done. Right. And this was beautifully written in that it forces you to look back at everything you've done and how much you've accomplished and to applaud yourself. We don't applaud ourselves. We're not our own cheerleaders, yet we are cheerleaders for everybody else. Yeah. And so I, I just wanted to share this because your listeners should think, take a breath, breath, take a moment, think about everything you've done and how hard it was and the opportunities you had and what you've accomplished have brought you to where you are today. That's the truth. And you need to celebrate that. And it's why I like reading off the background of our guests, because it's one thing, you know, yes, yeah, so no, tell me your background and they're going to leave out some stuff because it's hard to talk about yourself. And I like, I like being able, and I like people being able to hear about themselves. Um, and it's, it's just kind of nice. It makes you feel good. Like, yeah, that's uh, I, I did do all that. And I think that's the, those are, those are really good words that you, that you finished with. Uh, I, I want to read something to you that one of your um, avid supporters uh, had written. Um, it says, this is from uh, uh, Nikki Lambert Herkum. Um, I love the help, support, camaraderie, and sisterhood that MDIB gives. I've been in study clubs that were and are supportive, but none of the men get it when you're a woman in the old boys club. I think this is a huge problem. And as such, you're also an outnumbered mom, wife, business owner, et cetera. I found my people. I also have my new best friends who actually get me. And this is just mind blowing to me. And that's such a needed time in my life. Uh, you know, I, it goes on and on. And I just, uh, Grace, I think you've really found a void that needed to be filled. And it's, it's obvious from just sort of looking at testimonials and sort of doing some background that this is really, and actually people I know who are, who are members, this is really just a wonderful um, service that you're doing, great organization, great business that you've created. Thank and you. Uh, you should be really just so proud. It really fills, fills a need. And I think it's awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for bringing me on and letting me share a little bit about myself and what we're doing. And uh, I am grateful for the opportunity. Thanks for having me. Hi, you're welcome. And how do you, how do they find you if they want to get some more information on Mommy Dips and Business? Sure. Our website, mommydips.com is a great place to start. You can find us on Facebook and Instagram. Instagram is public so everyone can see it. The Facebook page is a private page. And so we do vet every single person. You have how do you to be vet? Like, so how do you like, like say, you know, I'm Denise Hartlieb and, and, <laughs> and mother of two. How, how, do you, how do you make sure Denise Hartlieb is not Dennis Hartlieb? Right. So we asked for their website and we need to, because ah. all dentists have their bio and headshot on their, on their website. And most dentists have a little blurb about, 
what they do in their free time and it'll say spending time with two boys and their two dogs oh, okay. in that okay. format. And then, and then we ask, you know, are you a mom? And they'll tell us yes or no. So that's how we do it. And we also have a lot of mom, mom, the Canadians say moms. Moms, um, like moms. moms. I just talked to somebody. And so they, they say, oh, well, I want my friend to join and she's a mom and she's a mommy dentist. So it's referral, you know, and then for those who we don't know, we just ask. Is there another model like this outside of dentistry? Mom, mom, lawyers in business, mom, accountants in business. So my sister started mommy lawyers in business. Oh, interesting. Yeah, so she's doing that. And, That's great. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I'm sure that there's a lot of other mom, for, I'm sure, mm-hmm. you know, facets and, 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 and their own thing, pharmacy or medical. Truck, truck driving. Um, right. So I'm sure there are. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Grace, I can't thank you enough. This is so generous of you with your time. I mean, I, I feel a little oh, it's my I, I just sort of took away half your day. Uh, no, though, no. I will tell you, you are very lucky because as we started the, the program this morning before we got in, on air, it's like minus five degrees here <laughs> in the Midwest. And Grace is smart enough and she's out west in Newport. And God bless you. You're so smart. Oh, no, I, I'm just fortunate. You know, I, I think there's a little bit of luck and a little bit of hard work and you got to make your own magic. So everyone listening, make your own magic. Yeah. Life's too short. Life is too short. So uh, dental online trainers, thank you for spending the time with us. Grace, I can't thank you enough. Um, it's uh, it really, this is a, such a great story. I mean, it's really, it's, it's really inspiring and um, you're, you're affecting a whole lot of people. So I can't thank you enough. So thank you. So Same to you, Dennis. Thank you for your time. You're welcome. All right, listeners, thank you for listening. And we'll look forward to seeing you at our next podcast or Surecast. And until then, yours for better dentistry. I'm Dr. Dennis Hartley. Hey, dental online trainers. Thanks again for listening. I hope that you enjoyed my conversation with Dr. Grace Young. And if you're a male dentist like myself, hopefully you'll have better insight to some of the struggles of many of our female counterparts. So look, if you are a male dentist and you're hiring a female associate, and she's a mom, you have to understand there's some other challenges that she's going to have that maybe we didn't have to deal with in our early days as our as practicing dentists. And if you're a female dentist, if you're a mom dentist, you know, here's a network for you to find support, you know, in your times of challenges, so that you're not alone. Now, look, if you love our sharecasts as much as I love giving our sharecast, tell your friends, send them a link. And don't forget to give us that coveted five star rating where Ever you listen to your podcast. Finally, if you're not a member of Dental Online Training yet, yet, check us out at dothandson.com for information about our live virtual courses. Um, in fact, our CPR for the Warren Dentition course, our most popular course is coming up at the end of March. So check that out. We also have our pre-recorded hands-on courses where we send you kits and you follow along on these pre-recorded courses at your pace, at your time, on your schedule from the comfort of your own practice. We have our mini tips. We have our recorded webinars. We have our coffee and donut study club that meets one Friday morning a month to go over problems that you might be having in your practice, whether they be clinic experiences or you know technique issues or just managing a practice. All, all, all conversations are open as we try to make each other better in our practices. Well, listen, until next time, thanks for listening. I'm Dr. Dennis Hartlieb. Yours for better dentistry.